you. Welcome back uh, to Representative Charlie Kimball, um, Windsor 5 District State Representative. That's for Woodstock, Plymouth, and Reading, and he has been with us the last couple of weeks. Uh, and again, we're recording on Friday, January. Charlie, is today the 21st? It is the 21st. Okay, so it's this is our third uh, week of the legislative session, and Charlie has just made it home from Montpelier, uh, and you're back in the State House for the first time in what, two years? Uh, since March 15th of 2020, so it uh, feels kind of weird, and we're in a hybrid situation, so even the committees are meeting. Some of the people are in, in the room, and other people are at home on video because they either have a sickness or they have someone who is sick in their house and they can't make it to the state house. so it's really weird trying to get used to that, but, um, but we're there, and that's great. It's great to be back in the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell me about this week. What was it like and how productive was it? And uh, what was the theme? Well, you know, I have to say that the word of the week is exacerbate. Uh, and we spent a long time talking to people in my committee about the workforce shortage and what's going on. And to a T, they're all saying it was worse before the pandemic in terms of having enough workers, but this has just exacerbated it. I, I think we heard that word probably 20 times. Uh, in terms of not having enough people, not having childcare, affordable housing, broadband, it just made all those situations worse. So that was kind of the word of the week. I'm assuming there's, there's, there's got to be a simple solution, correct? Oh, God, no, no. <laughs> you know, so we were asking everybody in state government and, and uh, associations, you know, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, talking about colleges, well, what can we do now to make the situation better? And it was mostly, well, you could solve the coronavirus problem. Like, yeah, okay, all right. And then you could import about 10,000 people. Like, no, that's not going to work either. And that was one of the things in the governor's budget address and talking about workforce. And so that was this week as the governor presented his budget. And um, he focused really on workforce uh, for a large part of it, which is great for our committee. We've been focused on that for years. So it's nice to have the governor focus that way now, too. Uh, but we have some differences of opinion. He wants to pay people to move here. We don't think that's a smart idea. We, you know, we want to take care of some of the fundamentals. So that was, that's always interesting, but he does want to invest a lot more in career and technical education and focus on the nobility of work and the people that are in the trades um, that are earning a great living and doing great work. And we agree, uh, we need to focus, but we also want to do some more things. But um, so the governor spent a lot of time on that housing, affordable housing and uh, trying to increase the number of units being built um, and really talking about the moment that we have now as the, the amount of money we have from ARPA and co, uh, the, the CARES Act before. There's a ton of money in the state uh, from the federal government. And how can we use that to really launch ourselves or position ourselves for a very prosperous future as a state? And that's, that's what we're debating now is to the governor's recommendations. Do we agree? And how do we move forward on that? So that's that's kind of where we are. Mm. And uh, so, bagging up for just a second, you're, you mentioned the um, the governor's plan to to bring more people into the state and uh, with incentives. Um, generally speaking, uh, so it, I, I think the as I was here listening to Vermont Public Radio uh, on, on about this, uh, it, it seems like. On one side of the issue you have, which I, I think it sounds like maybe you, you stand on that side, is that you, you feel like you got to take care of the people in the state first. And do you, but do you also feel that, I mean, we do need to increase the, um, the workforce at the same time? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things there. I mean, it's, it's really complex as to why people who are of eligible age are not working right now. Um, why they have left the workforce. We have 26,000 fewer workers we do now than we did two years ago. And why is that? Um, so, and are there reasons why, reasons that they left the workforce that we could address? Can we get them back in? So that's one of the issues. And it's um, not just an age issue. It's not just an age issue, no. Some people took early retirement, true. Some people decided they uh, they didn't like the job they were in. You know, it wasn't paying them enough to want to stay there. Uh, some because 
they had issues at home with uh, taking care of their kids or maybe an, a, an adult parent or uh, of course they're adults as parents but um so they're yeah, they so a lot of people left for a lot of different reasons um and there was a significant number of people that did leave because they didn't want to stay in the job they were in um so the people talk about this great resignation right now and we certainly have that had that happen in vermont um and then the question is how do you address that uh, do you make it a, a constituent contacted one of my colleagues she's 69 years old lives up in rochester and she's a nurse and she's tired i mean the nursing profession was tired before the pandemic and and they're tired more now uh, but she wanted to get back into the workforce, maybe work part time, but she's had a hard time getting a job that is open to her qualifications. She's a registered nurse. Uh, and they said, well, not, you're too old. Like, well, no, she's not. I mean, she's 69. Uh, she can still work productively, has all this experience. And so how can we make it easier for someone like her to get back into the workforce, maybe even work part time? So that's one of the barriers that I think we're looking at is uh, how do you make that happen? And the, the idea of paying someone to move here uh, is has been popular in the Senate. It has not been popular in the House. Um, so because we look at the fundamentals and um, it's, it's typical in, in business too. If you're going to offer a new incentive for a new customer, you better be offering that same incentive to your existing customers or you know what? Those customers are going to leave. Um, so it's, you just have to be fair. And this, and this, this offer was made by the governor, uh, prior to the pandemic and how, how did that pan out? So there's a different schools of thought. We just had a study done to say, have the incentives paid for people to move here with their jobs, remote workers, has that been beneficial? And then there's a study of the paying people to move here for a job in Vermont. Has that been beneficial? So the auditor, um, oh, there was a study done through the Department of Financial Regulation. They hired a consultant to do it. And the numbers say that of those people that moved, there was a positive financial benefit. But it was such a small number that moved because it's not a huge program. You can't really extrapolate from that that it would work if you did it at a bigger scale. Then the other question is, we've got about 20,000 people moving into the state every year and 20,000 people moving out of the state every year. They do that without incentives. So do you really need them? If they're gonna come to Vermont, uh, many say that is the icing on the cake. Well, there could be. Uh, maybe they'd eat the cake without icing anyway. Uh, so that's, from, from a financial standpoint, we just don't think it's enough of an incentive to move. They have to look at the quality of life we have here. What is the job they're going to have? Do they, can they afford the housing? Uh, is there enough child care available for them? So those are all the, the bigger questions. What's the school system like? Um, so if you can address those things, uh, that's going to be more impactful for someone considering moving here. We're pretty passionate about it in the house, and uh, it just drives us nuts. Um, but it's... That's all right. I mean, our, our Senate counterparts uh, think it's a good program. And you know, the weird thing is, if you look at ROI, it makes the most sense if you incent people to bring their jobs here because they're typically higher earners. Well, we really need people to work at all levels within the, uh, within the economy. And so we, it's, we need the incentive to provide people to take jobs that are open now and maybe get on that career path within Vermont employers. So that's what we're focused on. seems like wherever you go, um, uh, businesses are, most businesses are hiring and they can't get enough um, quality help right now and they can't get stable help. And I'm, man, we're a very, very small operation here, but we need help. And I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but we're, we're all shorthanded right now. And where are you going to find that person? Um, it, it is a hard thing. It's, it, and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Ding, ding, ding. Word of the week. Yeah, that's the word of the week. Of the week. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Charlie, any parting thoughts uh, uh, as we close out uh, this week? 
not particularly, but you have to remember when you go to stay in Montpelier after you've been, you have to remember a comb. You know, I, I didn't remember a comb when I packed. It was just terrible. So. Well, especially with the winter hats and everything. I mean, I've got a little bit going on today myself. I had to get a haircut yesterday, so I wouldn't have to worry about it as much. Oh, perfect. There you go. Yeah. 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 But, you know, you stay in a hotel or stay in somebody's house. And you find that you don't have your, your stuff. You know, uh, and it's just like, oh, that's how it goes. So does it look like you all will be there for the, uh, you know, going back, uh, some semblance of normal back to in person for the re remainder of the session? Or is it still remain to be seen? We're going to try. It's uh, really kind of odd when we are in the building um, and on the floor. We're not really on the floor. So people are on their computers participating over a Zoom call, but it's all of the 150 members of the house. But it's like a library at that point because people are like, Shh, have to be quiet. Um, so instead of being in your chair in the house, uh, you're on your computer somewhere in the state house building. So they're not using the committee rooms? We're using the committee rooms, but very fewer rooms than we had used before because we've taken over some of the common rooms. Uh, the big rooms that are downstairs are now committee rooms. The Senate is still meeting remotely, so we're using pretty much the entire footprint of the building. I know that one of the concerns when they're talking about uh, the state house uh, expansion plans was was the size of the rooms, and they were they were too small um, for um, you know in consideration of, of, of COVID and, and, and so forth. So I was wondering if you'd actually even be able to use those rooms. Now. Yeah, that's, they're really small. Our our room when we didn't have any restrictions, we might have we have eleven representatives in my committee. Plus a committee, Plus a committee assistant, maybe a ledge council, so we're up to 13. We might have 15 other people in that same room. And it's a pretty small room. So they'd be standing room only. You have people standing behind you, someone sitting in on, the, on a windowsill. Um, and now our maximum capacity for that room is 11. No, it's 13. 13 is our maximum capacity. So it's been scaled way back. And uh, yeah, the state house, by its, the way it's built, is not big enough big to enough accommodate, accommodate both the, the legislators and the public who attend. And it's the people's house. I mean, it's open, it's free. I mean, people are amazed all the time when they walk in, there's there's no metal detectors. You don't have to pass any kind of test. You don't have to, it's just open. And it's, uh, I love that part about it, but you have to accommodate the people who want to be in the, in the rooms and also the legislators who are conducting the business. And are, yeah. there still, are there still plans for renovation or expansion? The Capital Committee is actually uh, what's called the Corrections and Institutions Committee, but they're uh, discussing it now about looking at that the future building, uh, putting a second floor on the mezzanine level, perhaps, um, which, which is it's built structurally to do that, so it's got the right foundation for it. Uh, but and that was planned years ago. We just haven't moved to that yet. Uh, so it's we're one of the only state houses, I believe, that is still used in its original configuration. Um, so that's pretty unique. Other state houses, it's ceremonial, and then you've got where all the other work happens. Yeah, so it's pretty good. Um, to wrap this up, and I want to thank you, Charlie, for joining us again um, another um, for another week weekly wrap up from the legislature. And um, I'm, you know, it, it, it's good to hear that uh, you know getting back to some semblance of normal and, and, and doing pe um, the people's business in the in, in the people's house up there. So uh, uh, I hope hopefully it was fruitful, and we look forward to hearing some more. Thanks.